So, uh, I don't think we were live streaming anything before, but here we go. I'm gonna, uh, see if I can figure out how to get on this chat here. Yo, what's up, dudes? Yeah, there we go. That looks good. Okay, so, uh, I'm gonna go grab my beers and then, uh, let's get this shit started. It's gonna be exciting. Let's see here. Never done a power hour before. Never uh, live broadcast anything before. I have read the uh, Foucault before, but that was it was freshman year, freshman year of college, and I never read any philosophy before. Uh, today I'm reading chapter three of Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Uh, it's entitled Panopticism. It's a pretty pivotal chapter, really important in history. I don't know. I really, let me see, when this book came out. Hmm. Hmm, 1975. Pretty, pretty good stuff. Uh, yeah, hold on, let me just, let me just tell more people to come watch this. Yeah. Ooh, Kevin Carey. Are you here? Are you here, Kevin? Good to see you, buddy. Let's see here, uh, Modelo and Foucault. Come see it live. Damn, what's the, what's the, uh, here we go, that's the URL. Cool, cool, good. All right, all right. So I think what I'm gonna do is probably gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna start off with a shot. Oh, I got I got a second laptop over here for the timer. Found a nice website. It's got a timer on it. I'm gonna start that shit off. I'm gonna just like start drinking from the get go too. I guess that's the same as like a shot every minute. I'm just gonna start early at the beginning and then I'll finish early at the end. It's the same amount of time, same amount of beer, as far as I can tell. And uh, I'm gonna re I'm gonna read this out loud for everybody. So let's see here. Start that. We take this shot. Three panopticism. The following, according to an order published at the end of the 17th century, were the measures to be taken when the plague appeared in town. First, the strict spatial partitioning, the closing of the town and its outlying districts, a prohibition to leave the town on pain of death, the killing of all stray animals, the, di the division of the town into distinct quarters, each governed by an intendant. Each street is placed under the authority of a syndic who keeps under surveillance. If he leaves the street, he'll be condemned to death. On the appointed day, everyone is ordered to stay indoors. It is forbidden to leave on pain of death. The syndic himself comes to knock on the door of each house from the outside. He takes the key with him and hands it over to the intendant of the quarter. The intendant keeps it until the end of the quarantine. Each family will have its own provisions, but for bread and wine, small wooden canals are set up between the street and the interior of the houses, thus allowing each person to receive his ration without communicating with the suppliers and other residents. Meat, fish, and herbs will be hoisted up in the houses with pulleys and baskets. So oh, here we go, I gotta do another one now. Okay. Ooh, gotta mention too. Sup, Kev? Sup, Kev? Uh, it is absolutely necessary to leave the house will be done in turn, avoiding any meeting. Only the intendant, syndics, and guards will move about the streets and also between the infected houses from one corpse to another. The crows, who could be left to die, these are people of little substance who carry the stick, bury the dead, and clean up and do many vile and abject offices. It is a segmented and mobile frozen space. Each individual is fixed in his place, and if he moves, he does so at the risk of his life, contagion, or punishment. Serious shit. Inspections function ceaselessly. The gaze is alert everywhere. A considerable body of militia, 
commanded by good officers and men of substance, guards at the gate, at the town hall, and in every quarter to ensure the prompt obedience of the people and the most absolute authority of the magistrates, as also to observe all disorder, theft, and extortion. I'll also shout out to Theo Darst, also known as at Theo Dope on Twitter, for this cool stand for my beers. Uh, yeah. At the town gates will be an observation post at the end of each street sentinels. Every day, the intendant visits the quarter in his charge and inquires whether the syndics have carried out their tasks, whether the inhabitants have anything to complain of. They observe their actions. Every day, too, the syndic goes into the street for which he is responsible, stops before each house, gets all the inhabitants to appear at the windows. Those who live overlooking the courtyard will be allowed, allocated a window looking onto the street at which no one but they may show themselves. He calls each of them by name, informs himself as the state of each and every one of them, in which respect the inhabitants will be compelled to speak the truth under pain of death. If someone does not appear at the window, the syndic must ask why. If this, in this way, he will find out easily enough whether dead or sick are being concealed. Dead or sick are being concealed. Everyone locked up in his cage, everyone in his window, answering to his name and showing himself when asked. It is the great review of the living and the dead. This surveillance is based on a system of permanent registration. <clears throat> Reports from the syndics to the intendants, from the intendants to the magistrate or mayor. At the beginning of the lockup, the role of each of the inhabitants pre present in the town is laid down, one by one. This document bears the name, age, sex of everyone, notwithstanding his condition. A copy is sent to the intendant of the quarter, another to the office of the town hall, another to enable the syndic to make his daily roll call. <coughs> Everything that must be observed during the course of the visits, death, illness, complaints, irregularities, the course of the visits... Oh, let's get the line. Doesn't matter. The magistrates have complete control over the medical treatment. They have appointed a physician in charge. No other practitioner may treat, no apothecary prepare medicine, no confessor visit a sick person without having received from him a written note to prevent anyone from concealing and dealing with those sick of the contagion unknown to the magistrates. The registration of the pathological must be constantly centralized. The relation of each individual to his disease and to his death passes through the representatives of power. The registration they make of it, the decisions they take on it. Hold on, I'm going to share this link on Facebook too. Give me just a, just a sec here. Oh my goodness. Dead, bro, it's society. Okay. Um, uh, five or six days after the beginning of the quarantine, the process of purifying the houses one by one has begun. All the inhabitants are made to leave. In each room, the furniture and goods are raised from the ground or suspended from the air. Perfume is poured around the room. After carefully sealing the windows, doors, and even the keels with wax, the perfume is set alight. Sounds pretty intense. Being French must have sucked. Those who have carried out the work are searched as they were on entry in the presence of the residents of the house to see that they did not have something on their persons as they left and they did not have on entering. Four hours later, the residents are allowed to re-enter their homes. Here we go. This is important. I underlined it. The enclosed, segmented space observed at every point in which the individuals are inserted in a fixed place, in which the slightest movements are supervised, in which all events are recorded, in which an uninterrupted work of writing links the center and periphery, in which power is exercised without division according to a continuous hierarchical figure, in which each individual is constantly located, examined, and distributed among the living beings, the sick and the dead. All this constitutes a compact model of the disciplinary mechanism. It's important. The plague is met by order. Its function is to sort out every possible confusion, that of the disease which is transmitted when bodies are mixed together, that of evil which is increased when fear and death overcome prohibitions. Also, shout out to Mr. and Mrs. Holmes, getting married August 21st, 2010. for the shot glass. Uh, we found it in our house when we moved in. Okay, yep. <clears throat> uh, transmitted bodies are mixed together, that of evil, which is increased when fear and death overcome prohibitions. It lays down for each individual his place, his body, his disease, and his death, his well-being by means of an omnipresent and omniscient power that subdivides itself in a regular, uninterrupted way, even to the ultimate determination of the individual, of what characterizes him, of what belongs to him, of what happens to him. 
Against the plague, which is a mixture, discipline brings into play its power, which is one of analysis. A whole literary fiction of the festival grew up around the plague. Suspended laws, lifted prohibitions, the frenzy of passing time, bodies mingling together without respect, individuals unmasked, abandoning their statutory identity as the figure under which they had recognized, allowing a quite different truth to appear. Well, Uh, allowing quite a different truth to appear, but there was also a political dream of the plague, which was exactly its, rever uh, its reverse. Not the collective festival, but strict divisions. Not laws transgressed, but the penetration of regulation into even the smallest details of everyday life, through the mediation of the complete hierarchy that assumed the capillary function of, of power. Not masks that were put on and taken off, but the assignment to each individual of his true name, his true place, his true body, his true disease. The plague is a form, at once real and imaginary, of disorder had as its medical and political correlative discipline. Behind the disciplinary mechanisms can be read the haunting memory of contagions of the plague, of rebellions, crimes, vagabondage, desertions, people who appear and disappear, live and die in disorder. And that beer is gone. I only have one six pack too, so if I run out of beer before the hour's up, I guess, I guess I'm fucked. <laughs> If it is true that the leper gave rise to ritual's exclusion, which to a certain extent provided the model for and general form of the great confinement, then the plague gave rise to disciplinary people, uh, disciplinary projects. Rather than the massive binary division between one set of people and another, it called for multiple separations, individualizing distributions, an organization in depth of surveillance and control, and intensification and ramification of power. The leper was caught up in a practice of rejection, of exile slash enclosure. He was left to his doom in a mass among which it was useless to differentiate. Those sick of the plague were caught up in a meticulous tactical partitioning in which individual differentiations were constricting effort effects of a power that multiplied, articulated, and subdivided itself. You gotta read quick. You know, this is, uh, this is thick reading. The great confinement on the one hand, the correct training on the other. Those are two subdivisions. The leper in his separation, the plague in his segmentations. The first is marked, the second analyzed and distributed. The exile of the leper and the arrest of the plague do not bring with them the same political dream. The first is that of a pure community, the second that of a disciplined society. Two ways of exercising power over men, of controlling their relations, of separating out their dangerous mixtures. The plague-stricken town, traversed throughout with hierarchy, surveillance, observation, writing. The town immobilized by the functioning of an extensive power that bears in a distinct way all over individual bodies. This is the utopia of the perfectly governed city. The plague, envisaged, envisaged as a possibility at least, is the trial in the course of which one may define ideally the exercise of disciplinary power. Hmm. In order to make rights and laws function according to pure theory, the jurists place themselves in imagination in the state of nature. In order to see perfect disciplines... I'm spilling beer. I'm just going to keep this up here. There you go. Thanks, Modelo. Thank you. The jurists place themselves in imagination in the state of nature. In order to see perfect disciplines functioning, rulers dreamt of the state of plague. Underlying disciplinary projects, the image of the plague stands for all forms of confusion and disorder, just as the image of the leper cut off from all human contact underlies projects of exclusion. Oh, yep. They're different projects then, but not incompatible ones. We see them coming slowly together, and it is the peculiarity of the 19th century that it applied to the space of exclusion of which the leper was a symbolic inhabitant. Beggars, vagabonds, madmen, and this orderly form the real population. The technique of power proper to the disciplinary partitioning. Treat lepers as plague victims, project the subtle segmentation of discipline onto the confused space of internment, combine it with the methods of an analytical distribution proper to power, individualize the excluded, but use procedures of individualization to mark exclusion. This is what was operated regularly by disciplinary power from the beginning of the 19th century in the psychiatric asylum, the penitentiary, the reformatory, the approved school, and, to some extent, the hospital. 
Generally speaking, all the authorities exercising individual control function according to a double mode, that of binary division and branding, in parentheses, mad slash sane, dangerous slash harmless, normal slash abnormal, and that of the coercive assignment of differential distribution, who he is, where he must be, how he is to be characterized, how he is to be recognized, how a constant surveillance is to be exercised over him in an individual way, etc. On the other hand, the lepers are treated as plague victims. The tactics of individualizing disciplines are imposed on the excluded, and, on the other hand, the universality of disciplinary controls makes it possible to brand the leper and to bring into play against him the dualistic mechanism of exclusion. There you go. You know, what more can you say? The constant division between the normal and the abnormal, to which every individual is subject, brings us back to our own time. By applying the binary branding and exile of the leopard to quite different objects, the existence of a whole set of techniques and institutions for measuring, supervising, and correcting the abnormal brings into play the disciplinary mechanisms to which the fear of the plague gave rise. All the mechanisms of power which, even today, are disposed around the abnormal individual to brand him and to alter him are composed of those two forms from which they are distantly derived. Bentham's Panopticon is the architectural figure of this composition. We know the principle on which it is based, at the periphery, an annular building, at the center a tower. This tower is pierced with wide windows that open onto the inner side of the ring. The per periphic building is divided into cells, each of which extends the whole width of the building. They have two windows, one on the inside corresponding to the towers on the window, I mean the windows on the tower. The other on the outside allows the light to cross the cell from one end to the other. All that is needed then is to place a supervisor in the central tower and to shut up each cell a madman, a patient, a condemned man, a worker, or a schoolboy. By the effect of backlighting, one can observe from the tower, standing out precisely against the light, the small captive shadows in the cells of the periphery. They are like so many cages, so many small theaters, in which each actor is alone, perfectly individualized and constantly visible. The panoptic mechanism arranges spatial unities that make it possible to see constantly and to recognize immediately. In short, it reverses the principle of the dungeon, or rather, of its three functions, to enclose, to deprive of light, and to hide. It, prefer it preserves only the first and eliminates the other two. Full lighting and the eye of a supervisor capture a better than darkness, which is ultimately protected. Visibility is a trap. Visibility is a trap. To begin with, this is made possible. This made it possible, as a negative effect, to avoid those compact, swarming, howling masses that were to be found in places of confinement, those painted by Goya or described by Howard. Each individual, in his place, is securely confined to a cell from which he can be seen from the front by the supervisor. But the sidewalls prevent him from coming into contact with another companion. He is seen, but he does not see. He is the object of information, never a subject in communication. Oh, yeah, there it goes. The arrangement of his room, opposite the central tower, imposes on him an axial visibility. But the divisions of the ring, those separated cells, imply a lateral invisibility. They're trying to make you blind to what's around you. The arrangement of his room... Oh, yeah, there we go. And this invisibility is a guarantee of order, right? Lateral invisibility is a guarantee of order. If the inmates are convicts, there is no danger of a plot, an attempt at a collective escape, the planning of new crimes for the future, bad reciprocal influences. If they are patients, there is no danger of contagion. If they are madmen, there is no risk of their committing violence upon one another. If they are school children, there is no copying, no noise, no chatter, and no waste of time. If they are workers, there are no disorders, no theft, no coalitions, none of those distractions that slow down the rate of work make it less perfect or cause accidents. The crowd, a compact mass, a locus of multiple exchanges, individualities merging together, a collective effect, is abolished and replaced by a collection of separated individualities. From the point of view of a guardian, it is replaced by a multiplicity that can be numbered and supervised. From the point of view of the inmates, by a sequence and observed solitude. Quoted in Bentham, pages 60 through 64. Hold on. Let me see. I got some got some notifications here. Let me make sure the viewers aren't hungry for some more. No, no, it's my mom. Uh, somebody. No, don't care. Don't care. Okay. Uh, let me just let me just share this real quick again. You know, let's try to shake up some uh, some interest here. Yeah, I'll make it public. I don't care. I'll like, and I'm gonna comment. Hey. Now we'll get to show up on some news feeds. There we go. 
That's what it's about, getting the word out there. Right? Lateral visibility. <laughs> Lateral visibility. It's the opposite of what Foucault said. Hence the major effect of the panopticon, to induce in the inmate a state of conscious and permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. This Modelo is going down easy. I'm liking it. So to arrange things that the surveillance it is permanent in its effects, even if it, it even if it is discontinuous in its action, that the perfection of power should tend to render its actual exercise unnecessary. That this ar architectural apparatus should be a machine for creating and sustaining a power relation independent of the person who exercises it. In short, that the inmates should be caught up in a power situation of which they themselves are the bearers. To achieve this, it is at once too much and too little that the prisoner should be constantly observed by an inspector. Too little, for what matters is that he knows himself to be observed. Too much, because he has no need, in fact, of being so. In view of this, Bentham laid down the principle that power should be visible and, and unverifiable. Visible. The inmate will constantly have before his eyes the tall outline of the central tower from which he is spied upon. Unverifiable. The inmate must never know whether he is being looked at any one moment, but he must be sure that he may always be so. In order to make the presence or absence of the inspector unverifiable so that the prisoners in their cells cannot even see a shadow, Bentham envisaged not only Venetian blinds on the windows of the central observation hall, but, on the inside, partitions that intersected the hall at right angles and, in order to pass from one quarter to the other, not doors, but zigzag openings. For the slightest noise, a gleam of light, a brightness in a half-open door, would betray the presence of the guardian. The panopticon is a machine for dissociating the see-slash-being-seen dyad. In the peripheric ring, one is totally seen without ever seeing. In the central tower, one sees everything without ever being seen. <sighs> wow, my mom likes my post in the Dead Bro at Society about this. That's nice. I'm glad my mom's here to appreciate my posts. Um, let's keep going. It is an important mechanism for it automate, automatizes and disindividualizes power. Power has its principle not so much in a person as in a certain concerted distribution of bodies, surfaces, lights, gazes, and an arrangement whose internal mechanisms produce the relation in which individuals are caught up. Hi, Mom. The ceremonies, the rituals, the marks by which the sovereign surplus power was manifested are useless. There is a machinery that assures dissymmetry, dis disequilibrium, difference. Consequently, it does not matter who exercises power. Any individual, taken almost at random, can operate the machine. In the absence of the director, his family, his friends, his visitors, even his servants. Similarly, it does not matter what, motivate, what motive animates him. The curiosity, the curiosity of the arid, indiscreet, the malice of a child, the thirst for knowledge of a philosopher who wishes to visit this museum of human nature, or the perversity of those who take pleasure in spying and punishing. The more numerous those anonymous and temporary observers are, the greater the risk for the inmate of being surprised, and the greater his anxious awareness of being observed. The panopticon is a marvelous machine which, whatever use one may wish to put it to, produces homogeneous effects of power. Oh, hello, Quinn, as well. Ooh. Quinn, I hope you like this. This is important. If you're, ever, uh, if you're ever looking for something good to read, I recommend this book, Discipline and Punish, Michel Foucault. A real subjection is born mechanically from a fictitious relation, so it is not necessary to use force to constrain the convict to good behavior, the madman to calm, the worker to work, the schoolboy to application, the patient to the observation of the regulations. Bentham was surprised that panoptic institutions could be so light. There were no more bars, no more chains, no more heavy locks. All that was needed was the separations should be clear and the openings well arranged. The heaviness of the old houses of security with their fortress-like architecture could be replaced by simple economic geometry of the house of certainty. 
the efficiency of power its constraining force have, in a sense, passed over to the other side, to the side of its surface of application. He who is subjected to a field of visibility, and who knows it, assumes responsibility for the constraints of power. He makes them play spontaneously upon himself. He inscribes in himself the power relation in which he simultaneously plays both roles. He becomes the principle of his own subjection. That's right. You will become the principle of your own subjection. Thanks, Cheryl. Good to see you. Hello. By this very fact, the external power may throw off its physical weight. It tends to the non-corporeal, and to the more the more it approaches this limit, the more constant, profound, and permanent are its effects. It is a perpetual victory that avoids any physical confrontation, which is always decided in advance. Bentham does not say whether he was inspired in his project by Laveau's Menagerie at Versailles, the first menagerie in which the different elements are not, as they traditionally were, distributed in a park. At the center was an octagonal pavilion which, on the first floor, consisted of only a single room, the King's Salon. On every side, large windows looked out onto seven cages. The eighth side was reserved for the entrance, containing different species of animals. By Bentham's time, this menagerie had disappeared, but one finds in the program of the Panopticon a similar concern with individualizing observation, with characterization and classification, with the analytical arrangement of space. <sighs> oh my goodness. Uh, analytical arrangement of space. The Panopticon is a royal menagerie. The animal is replaced by man, individual distribution by specific grouping, and the king by the machinery of a furtive power. With this exception, the Panopticon also does the work of a naturalist. It makes it possible to draw up dual without the proximity, oh, skipped a line, to draw differences among patients, to observe the symptoms of each individual without the proximity of beds, the circulation of miasmas, the effects of contagion confusing the clinical tables. Among school children, it makes possible to observe performances without there being any imitation or copying, to map attitudes, to assess characters, and to drop rigorous classifications, and in relation to normal development, to distinguish laziness and stubbornness from incurable imbecility. Imbecility, that's a great word, I love it. Among workers, it makes it possible to note an aptitude of each worker, compare the time he takes to perform a task, and if they are paid by the day to calculate their wages. So much for the question of observation, but the panopticon was also a laboratory. It could be used as a machine to carry out experiments, to alter behavior, to train or correct individuals to experiment with medicines and monitor their effects, to try out different punishments on prisoners according to their crimes and character, and to seek the most effective ones, to teach different techniques simultaneously to the workers, to decide which is best, to try out pedagogical experiments, and in particular to take up once again the well-debated problem of secluded education by using orphans. One would see that what would happen when, in their 16th or 18th year, they were presented with other boys or girls. One could verify whether, as Helvetius thought, anyone could learn anything, one who would follow the genealogy of every observable idea. One who could bring up different children according to different systems of thought, making certain children believe that two and two do not make four, or that the moon is a cheese. <clears throat> or that the moon is a cheese. Then put them together with their 20 or 25 years old, one would have the discussions that would be worth a great deal more than the sermons or lectures on which money, much money is spent. Uh, one would have at least an opportunity of making discoveries in the domain of metaphysics. The Panopticon is a privileged place for experiments on men and for analysis with complete certainty the transformations that may be obtained from them. The Panopticon may even provide an apparatus for supervising its own mechanisms. In the central tower, the director may spy on all the employees that he has under his orders, nurses, doctors, foremen, teachers, wardens. He will be able to judge them continuously, alter their behavior, impose upon them methods he thinks best. And it will even be possible to to observe the director himself. An inspector arriving unexpectedly at the center of the panopticon will be able to judge a glance, without anything being concealed from him, how the entire establishment is functioning. Ooh, let me check these notifs real quick. Gwen, good to hear from you, dude. Love you, buddy. Ooh. Yep, yep. Mm, can't read that one right now. Yeah, if you guys have requests or questions, you know, I'll take them on. Just post them in the little chat box. You know, I love you guys. There's a drink 26 right there. Gotta, gotta stay loaded. Let's see here. The Panopticon is a privileged place for experiments. Right. 
It may even provide an apparatus for, yep, 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 got that. Uh, in any case, enclosed as he is in the middle of an architectural mechanism, is not the director's own fate entirely bound up with it? The incompetent physician who has allowed contagion to spread, the incompetent prison governor or workshop manager will be the first victims of an epidemic or revolt. By every tie I could devise, said the master of the Panopticon, my own fate had been bound up with me by theirs. The Panopticon functions as a kind of laboratory of power. Thanks to its mechanisms of observation, it gains in efficiency and inability to penetrate into men's behavior. Knowledge follows the advances of power, discovering new objects of knowledge over all the surfaces on which power is exercised. The plague-stricken town, the panoptic establishment, the differences are important. Let's get into them. Michelle, I love what you're saying right now. They mark, at a distance of a century and a half, the transformations of the disciplinary program. In the first case, there is an exceptional situation. Against an extraordinary evil, power is mobilized. It makes itself everywhere present and visible. It invents new mechanisms. It separates. It immobilizes. It partitions. It constructs for a time what is both a counter city and the perfect society. It imposes an ideal functioning, but one that is reduced in the final analysis, like the evil that it combats, to a simple dualism of life and death. That which moves brings death, and one kills that which moves. One kills that which moves. Oh, where the fuck was that? Uh, yep. The panopticon, on the other hand, must be understood as a generalizable model of functioning, a way of defining power relations in terms of the everyday life of men. No doubt, Bentham represents presents it as a particular institution closed in upon itself. Utopias, perfectly closed in upon themselves, are common enough. As opposed to the ruined prisons, littered with mechanisms of torture to be seen in Pyrenees' engravings, the panopticon presents a cruel, ingenious cage. The fact that it should have given rise, even in our own time, to so many variations, projected or realized, is evidence of the imaginary intensity that is possessed for almost 200 years. But the panopticon must not be understood as a dream building. It is a diagram of a mechanism of power reduced to its ideal form. Reduced to its ideal form, its functioning, abstracted from any obstacle, resistance, or friction, must be represented as a pure architectural and optical system. It is in fact a figure of political technology that may and must be detached from any specific use. It is polyvalent in its applications. It serves to reform prisoners, but also to treat patients, to instruct school children, to confine the insane, to supervise workers, to put beggars and idlers to work. It is a type of location of bodies in space, of distribution of individuals in relation to one another, of hierarchical organization, of disposition of centers and channels of power, of def definition of the instruments and modes of intervention of power, which can be implemented in hospitals, workshops, schools, prisons. Whether one is dealing with a multiplicity of individuals on whom a task or a particular form of behavior must be imposed, the panoptic schema may be used. It is necessary, it is, necessary modifications apart, applicable to all establishments whatsoever in which a space not too large to be covered or commanded by buildings, a number of persons are meant to be kept under inspection. Inspection, from uh, quoted in Bentham on page 40, although Bentham takes the penitentiary house as his prime example, it is because he has many different functions to fulfill, safe custody, confinement, solitude, forced labor, and instruction. In each of his applications, it makes it possible to reflect the exercise of power. It does this in several ways, because it can reduce the number of those who exercise it, while increasing the number of those on whom it is exercised. Because it is possible to intervene at any moment, and because the constant pressure acts even before the offenses, mistakes, or crimes have been committed. Oh, sorry, let me reread that. Because it is possible to intervene at any moment, and because the constant pressure acts even before the offense, crime, or mistake has been committed. Because in these conditions, its strength is that it never intervenes, it is exercised spontaneously and without noise, it constitutes a mechanism whose effects follow from one another. Because without any physical instrument other than the architectural geometry, it acts directly on individuals. It gives power of mind over mind. The panoptic schema makes any apparatus of power more intense. It assures its economy in material and personnel and time. It assures its, its effic 
efficacity by its preventative character, its continuous functioning, and its automatic mechanisms. It is a way of obtaining from power. <sighs> it is a way of obtaining from power in hitherto unexampled quality, a great and new instrument of government. Its great excellence consists in the greatest strength it is capable of giving to any institution it may be thought proper to apply it to. Quoted in Bentham, page 66. Ooh, hello Eva, I see you're watching too, hello. This live stream is, uh, I'm doing a power hour and I'm reading chapter 3, the panopticism of Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Hope you like it. Uh, it's a uh, young flip phone on Twitter if you guys are looking for it. It's a case of, it's easy once you've thought of it in the political sphere. It can in fact be in integrated into any function, education, medical, treatment, production, punishment. It can increase the effect of this function by being linked closely with it. It can constitute a mixed mechanism in which relations of power and of knowledge may be precisely adjusted in the smallest detail to the processes that are to be supervised. It can establish a direct proportion between surplus power and surplus production. In short, it arranges things in such a way that the exercise of power is not added on from the outside like a rigid, heavy constraint to the function it invests, but is so subtly present in them that as to increase their efficiency by itself increasing its own points of contact. The panoptic mechanism is not simply a hinge, a point of exchange between a mechanism of power and a function. It is a way of making power relations function in a function, and of making a function function through those power relations. Bentham's preface to Panopticon opens the list of the benefits to be obtained from his inspection house. Uh, in quotes, morals reformed, health preserved, industry invigorated, instruction diffused, public burthens lightened, economy seated, as it were, upon a rock, the Gordian knot of the poor laws, not cut, but untied, all by a simple idea in architecture, quoted in Bentham, page 39. Furthermore, the arrangement of this machine is such that its enclosed nature does not preclude a permanent presence from the outside. We have seen that anyone may come and exercise in the central tower the functions of surveillance, and that, this being the case, he can gain a clear idea of the ways in which this surveillance is practiced. Good lord. Yep, there we go. In fact, any panoptic institution, even if it is as regularly closed as a penitentiary, may without difficulty be subjected to such irregular and constant inspections, and not only by appointed inspectors, but also by the public. Any member of society will have the right to come and see with his own eyes how the schools, hospitals, factories, prisons function. There is no risk, therefore, that the increase of power created by the panoptic machine may degenerate into tyranny. tyranny. The disciplinary mechanism will be democratically controlled since it will be constantly accessible to the great tribunal committee of the world. This panopticon, subtly arranged so that an observer may observe at a glance so many different individuals, also enables everyone to come and observe any of the observers. The seeing machine was once a sort of dark room into which individuals spied. It has become a transparent building in which the exercise of power may be supervised by society as a whole. Let me just make sure you guys heard that. Uh, it has become a transparent building in which the exercise of power may be supervised by society as a whole. Suddenly we've moved into, into a realm, just, you know, including everybody. It's great. The panoptic schema, without disappearing as such or losing any of its pr properties, was destined to spread throughout the social body. Its vocation was to become a generalized function. The plague-stricken town provided an exceptional disciplinary model, perfect but absolutely violent. To the disease that brought death, power opposed its perpetual threat of death. Life inside it was reduced to its simplest expression. It was, against the power of death, the meticulous exercise of the right of the sword. The panopticon, on the other hand, has a role of amplification. Although it arranges power, although it is intended to make more economic and more effective, it does not so for power itself, nor for the immediate salvation of a threatened society. The Panopticon's aim is to strengthen the social forces, to increase production, to develop the economy, spread education, raise the level of public morality, to increase and to multiply. Now, how is power to be strengthened in such a way that, far from impeding progress, far from weighing upon it with the rules and regulations, it actually facilitates such progress? What intensificator of power will be able, at the same time, to be a manipulator of production? 
How will power, by increasing its forces, be able to increase those of society instead of confiscating them or impeding them? The Panopticon solution to this problem is that the productive increase of power can be assured only if, on the one hand, it can be exercised continuously in the very foundations of society, in the subtlest possible way, and if, on the other hand, it functions outside of these sudden, violent, and discontinuous forms that are bound up with the exercise of sovereignty. Ooh, hey, Sam Goldstein69. Good to see you here. The body of the king, with its strange material and physical presence, with the force that he himself deploys or transmits to some few others, is at the opposite extreme of this new physics of power represented by panopticism. The domain of panopticism is, on the contrary, that whole lower region, that region of irregular bodies, with their details, their multiple movements, their heterogeneous forces, their spatial relations. What are required are mechanisms that analyze distributions, gaps, series, combinations, and which use instruments that render visible, record, and differentiate and compare. A physics of a relation a relational and multiple power, which has its maximum intensity not in the person of the king, but in the bodies that can be individualized by these relations. <laughs> Sorry for the break, I just gotta, you know, stay hydrated, crack a brew. Y'all know how it goes. There we go. Mm, yeah, let's see here. Where the fuck was I? Right. At the theoretical level, Bentham defines another way of analyzing the social body and the power relations that traverse it. In terms of practice, he defines a procedure of subordination of bodies and forces that must increase the utility of power while practicing the economy of the prince. Panopticism is the general principle of a new political autonomy whose object and end are not the relations of sovereignty, but the relations of discipline. The celebrated, transparent, circular cage with its high tower, powerful and knowing, may have been for Bentham a project of perfect disciplinary institution, but he also set out to show how one may unlock the disciplines and get them to function in a diffused, multiple, polyvalent way throughout the whole social body. These disciplines, which the classical age has elaborated in specific, relatively enclosed places, barracks, schools, workshops, and those total limitations, had been imagined only at the limited and temporary scale of a plague-stricken town. Bentham dripped of transforming into a network of mechanisms that would be everywhere and always alert, running through society without interruption in space or in time. The panoptic arrangement provides the formula for this generalization. Its programs, at the level of an elementary and easily transferable mechanism, the basic functioning of society penetrated through and through with disciplinary mechanisms. There are two images, then, of discipline. At one extreme, the discipline blockade, the enclosed institution established on the edges of society, turned inwards towards negative functions, arresting evil, breaking communication, suspending time. At the other extreme, with panopticism, is the discipline mechanism, which can be identified by a functional mechanism that must improve the exercise of power by making it lighter, more rapid, more effective, a design of subtle coercion for a society to come. Movement from one project to the other, from a scheme of exceptional discipline to one of a generalized surveillance, rests on a historical transformation, the gradual extension of the mechanisms of discipline, of discipline throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. They spread throughout the whole social body, the formation of what might be called in general the disciplinary society. The disciplinary society, you see? A whole disciplinary generalization, the Benthamite physics of power, represents an acknowledgment of this, had operated through the classical age. The spread of disciplinary institutions, whose network was beginning to cover an ever larger surface and occupying, above all, a less and less marginal position, testifies to this. What was an aisle, a privileged place, a circumstantial measure, uh circumstantial measure or a singular model became a general formula. The regulations characteristic of the Protestant and pious armies of William of Orange or of Gustavus Adolphus were transformed into regulations of all the armies of Europe. The model colleges of the Jesuits, 
or the schools of the Batancourt or Demia, followed by the examples set by Strum, provided the outlines for the general forms of educational discipline. The ordering of the naval and military hospitals provided the model for the entire reorganization of hospitals in the 18th century. But this extension of the disciplinary institutions was no doubt only the most visible aspect of various more profound processes. One, the functional inversion of the disciplines. At first, they were expected to neutralize dangers, to fix useless or distributed populations, to avoid the inconveniences of overlarge assemblies. All right, commenters, uh, only one Modelo. Are you joking me here? Let's just. This is drink number 42. We got four Modelos gone. Mod number five right now, six. Thanks. Uh. <clears throat> At first, they were expected to neutralize dangers, to fix useless or distributed populations, to avoid the inconveniences of overlarge assemblies. Now they were being asked to play a positive role. They were becoming able to do so to increase the possible utility of individuals. Military discipline is no longer a mere means of preventing looting, desertion, or failure to obey orders among the troops. It has become a basic technique to enable the army to exist. Not only as an assembled crowd, but as a unity that derives from this very unity and increase in its forces. Discipline increases the skill of each individual, coordinates these skills, accelerates movements, increases firepower, broadens the fronts of attack without reducing their vigor, increases the capacity for resistance, etc. The discipline of the workshop, while remaining away for enforcing respect for the regulations and authorities, of preventing thefts, thefts or losses tends to increase aptitudes, speeds, output, and therefore profits. It still exerts a moral influence over behavior, but more and more it treats actions into terms of their results, introduces bodies into a machinery, forces into an economy. When, in the 17th century, the provincial schools or the Christian elementary schools were founded, the justifications given for them were above all negative. Those poor who were unable to bring up their children left them in ignorance of their obligations. Given the difficulties they had in earning a living and themselves having been badly brought up, they are unable to communicate a sound upbringing that they themselves never had. This involves three major inconveniences. Ignorance of God, idleness with its consequent drunkenness and purity larceny brigandage, and the formation of those gangs of beggars always ready to stir up a public disorder and virtually to exhaust the funds of the Hotel Dieu, according to Diema, 60-61. Now, at the beginning of the revolution, the end laid down for primary education was to be, among other things, to fortify, to develop the body, to prepare the child for a future in some mechanical work, and to give him an observant eye, a sure hand, and prompt habits. Quoted in Talleyrand's report to the Consti Constituent Assembly, 10th of September, 1791, quoted by Leon and page 106. The disciplines function increasingly as techniques for making useful individuals. Hence their emergence from a marginal position on the confines of society and the detachment from the forms of exclusion or expatriation, I mean expiation, confinement or retreat. Hence the slow loosening of their kinship with religious regularities and enclosures. Hence also their rooting in the most important, most central, and most productive sectors of society. They become attached to some of the great essential functions, factory production, the transmission of knowledge, the diffusion of aptitudes and skills, the war machine. Hence, too, the double tendency one sees developing throughout the 18th century to increase the number of disciplinary institutions and to discipline the existing apparatuses, obviously. Number two, the swarming of disciplinary mechanisms. While, on the one hand, the disciplinary establishments increase, their mechanisms have a certain tendency to become deinstitutionalized, to emerge from the enclosed fortresses from which they once functioned, to circulate in a free state. The massive, complex disciplines are broke down into a flexible method of control, which may be transferred and adapted. Sometimes the closed apparatuses add to their internal and specific function of a role of external surveillance, developing around themselves a whole margin of lateral controls. 
Thus, the Christian school must not simply train docile children. It must also make it possible to supervise the parents to gain information as to the way of life, their resources, their piety, their morals. The school tends to constitute minute social observatories that penetrate even to the adults and exercise regular supervision over them. The bad behavior of the child or his absence is a legitimate pretext, according to Damia, for one to go and question the neighbors, especially if there is any reason to believe that the family will not tell the truth. One can then go and question the parents themselves to find out whether they know the catechism and the prayers, where they are determined to root out the vices of the children, how many beds are on the house, and what the sleeping arrangements are. Uh, at Sam Goldstein sixty nine, aka at uh, Young Youthful Bobby on Twitter, uh, I'm not from Mexico. I'm from California, but we're close. We're neighbors. Uh, the yeah, the giving of alms, the present of a religious picture, or the provision of additional beds. Uh, quoted in Demia thirty through forty, thirty nine through forty. <sighs> yeah, you know what? This part's actually pretty stupid. I'm gonna skip ahead to reason number three here. One also sees the spread of disciplinary procedures not in the form of enclosed institutions, but as centers of observation disseminated throughout society. Religious groups and charity organizations have long played this role of discipline. The population. From the Counter-Reformation to the philanthropy of the July monarchy, initiatives of this type continue to increase. Their aims are religious, conversion and moralization, economic, aid and encouragement to work, or political, the struggle against discontent or agitation. Well, this is the last of my six-pack, y'all. i got about ten minutes left in the challenge. I don't think I'm going to finish the chapter, but maybe after I finish this beer, I'll just uh, I'll keep reading for you. I really hope you guys are learning something here. Sorry, at Sam Goldstein sixty nine. I didn't mean to wrongfully out you as Bobby Swainhart. <sighs> Woo! Needed that. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah. One is only to cite by way of example the regulations for the charity associations of the Paris parishes. The territory to be covered was divided into quarters and cantons, and the members of the association divided themselves up along the same lines. These members had their visit to their prospective areas regularly. They will strive to eradicate places of ill repute, tobacco shops, life classes, gaming houses, public scandals, blasphemy, and propriety, and any other disorders that may come to their knowledge. They will also have to make individual visits to the poor, and the information to be obtained is laid down in regulations. The stability of the lodging, knowledge of prayers, attendance of the sacraments, knowledge of a trade, morality, in front of these, and whether or not they have fallen into poverty through their own fault. Lastly, one must learn by skillful questioning in what way they are they behave at home, whether there is peace between them and their neighbors, whether they are careful to bring up their children in the fear of God, whether they do not have children or different sexes sleeping together and with them, whether they do not allow licentiousness and cajolery in their families. Listen. Licentiousness, cajolery. That's some shit we gotta end, y'all. Uh, yeah. Uh, especially in their older daughters, right? Cajolerous older daughters, that shit sucks. Okay. Uh, if one has any doubts as to whether they are married, one must ask to see their marriage certificate. Duh. Uh, number three, the state control of the mechanisms of discipline. In England, it was private religious groups that carried out for a long time the functions of the social discipline. Uh, C.F. Radzinovitz, 203 through 14. In France, although part of this role remained in the hands of parish guilds or charity associations, another, and no doubt the most important part, was very soon taken over by the police apparatus. The organization of a central police had long been regarded, even by the contemporaries, as the most direct expression of royal absolutism. Absolutism. The sovereign had wished to have his own magistrate with whom he might directly entrust his orders, his commissions, intentions, and who was entrusted with the execution of orders and orders under the king's private seal.
A note by Duval, first secretary at the police magistrate, quoted in Funk Britanniano uh, 1. In effect, in taking over a number of pre-existing functions, the search for criminals, urban surveillance, economic and political supervision, the police magistrates, and the magistrature general that presided over them in Paris transposed them into a single strict administrative machine. All the radiations of force and information that spread from the circumference cumulate cum culminate sorry, in the magistrate general. It is he who operates all the wheels that together produce order and harmony. The effects of his administration cannot be better compared than to the movement of the social bodies, quoted in Desisart 344 and 528. Not conjurously, cajolerously. Like cajolery, like horseplay, like cajoling around. Ooh, we've got some notifications over on Facebook. Let me take a sec. Mm, we got some. Uh, we got some chats. Oh, Jerry, Jeremy Romero. Nice to see you, buddy. Haven't talked to you in a minute. How you doing? And some uh, some stupid shit I don't care about. Cool, cool. Uh, thank you, everybody. Hope you guys are actually watching, cause uh, I would like to hear what you have to say about this. Hope you like. The Panopticon got about 16 seconds for my next drink. Uh, but although the police as an institution were certainly organized in the form of a state apparatus, and although this was certainly linked to the direct center of political sovereignty, the type of power that it exercises, the mechanisms it operates, and the elements to which it applies them are specific. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit to a good quote here. I underline it. it says, uh, Police power must bear over everything. It is not, however, the tonality of the state nor of the kingdom as visible and invisible body of the monarch. It is the dust of events, actions, behavior, opinions. Everything that happens. The police are concerned with those things of every moment, those unimportant things of which Catherine II spoke in her great instruction, supplement to the instruction for the drawing of, of a new code, 1769, Article 55, 535. With the police... One is in the indefinite world of a supervision that seeks, ideally, to reach the most elementary particle, the most passing phenomenon of the social body. You know what I'm saying? The ministry of the magistrates and police officers is of the greatest importance. The objects that it embraces are, in a, kit, in a sense, definite. One may perceive them only by a sufficiently detailed examination. Quoted in Delamere, unnumbered preface, the infinitely small of political power. Shit, quote, are you joking me? And in order to be exercised, this power has to be given the instrument of permanent, exhaustive, omnipresent surveillance, capable of making all visible, as long as it, as it could itself remain invisible. It had to be like a faceless gaze that transformed the whole social body into a field of perception. Thousands of eyes posted everywhere, mobile attentions ever on alert, a long hierarchicalized network which, according to Lemaire, comprised for Paris the 48 commissaries, the 20 inspectures, and the observers who were paid regularly, and the basis mouches, or secret agents who were paid by the day, then the informers paid according to the job done, and finally the prostitutes. Obviously, it all goes back to prostitution. What the fuck did you think? And this increasing, unceasing observation had to be accumulated in a series of reports and registers throughout the 18th century. An immense police text increasingly covers society by means of a complex documentary organization. On the police registers of the 18th century, C.F. Chasson. And unlike the methods of judicial or administrative writing, what was registered in this way were forms of behavior attitudes, possibilities, suspicions, a permanent account of the individual's behavior. Uh, this is this is drink number 55 for those of you joining me right now. Now it should be noted that although the police supervision was entirely in the hands of the king, it did not function in a single direction. It was in fact a double entry system. It had to correspond by manipulating the machinery of justice to the immediate wishes of the king, but it was also capable of responding to solicitations from below, the celebrated letters du cachet, in order uh, or orders under the king's private seal, which were a long symbol of arbitrary royal rule, which brought detention into disrepute and on political grounds. Oh. Uh, the function was to punish agitation, disobedience, and bad conduct, those things that Ledoux wanted to exclude from his architecturally perfect city. 
In short, 18th century police added a disciplinary functions to its role as the auxiliary of justice in the pursuit of criminals and as an instrument for the political supervision of plots, oppositions, movements, or revolts. It was a complex function since it linked the absolute power of the monarch to the lowest levels of power disseminated society since between these different enclosed institutions of discipline, i.e. workshops, armies, or schools, it extended an intermediary network acting where they could not intervene, disciplining the non-disciplinary spaces. But it filled in the gaps, linking them together, guaranteed its armed forces an interstitial discipline and a meta-discipline by means of a wise police, the sovereign accustoms of the people to order and obedience. Quoted in Vettel, page 162. The organization of the police apparatus in the 18th century sanctioned a generalization of the disciplines that became co-extensive with the state itself. Although it was linked to the most explicit way with everything in the royal power that exceeded the exercise of regular justice, it is understandable why the police offered such slight resistance to the rearrangement of the judicial power, and why it has not ceased to impose its prerogatives upon it with ever-increasing weight right up to the present day. This is no doubt because it has a secular arm of the judiciary, but it is also because, to a far greater degree than the judicial institution, it is defined by reason of the extent and mechanisms with the society of the disciplinary type. It, yet, it would be wrong to believe that dis the disciplinary functions were confiscated and absorbed once and for all by a state apparatus. Discipline may be identified neither with an institution nor with an apparatus. It is a type of power, a modality for its exercise, comprising a whole set of instruments, techniques, procedures, levels of applications, and targets. It is a physics or an anatomy of power, a technology. Oh, I'm done with my beers, y'all. I'm just going to take this last shot. Got a 58 out of 60. When this timer goes off, I'll have a 50 out of 60, you know? Discipline may be identified neither with an institution nor with an apparatus. It's a type of power. I mean, I already read this, didn't I? Uh, it targets a physics or an anatomy of power. A technology. It may be taken either as either by specialized institutions, the penitentiaries or houses of correction in the 19th century, or by institutions that use it as an essential instrument for a particular end, schools, hospitals, etc., or by pre-existing authorities that find it a means for reinforcing or rearranging their internal mechanisms of power. Actually, wait, that was perfect. I started at zero and I just ended at 59, so that's a total of uh, 60, 60 shots. I nailed it. Uh, I did, uh, it's my first power hour ever. I've never done one of those before. Got about, let's see here. Jesus Christ. Uh, fucking A. Got about 13 pages left in this chapter. Maybe I'll just read what I highlighted, because, you know, it's really what counts. Yeah, if you want to see nudes, text me. My number is 512-897-4881. That's right, 512-897-4881. Text me for nudes. I respond very quickly, and I have a great-looking penis. Thank you. Moving on to my highlighted sections, I'm going to say, uh, oh, to render accessible to a multitude of men in the inspection of a small number of objects. That's right, that's the point of the police force, is to render accessible to a multitude of men a small number of objects, as in your personal life. Then I underlined, uh, the modern age poses the opposite problem, which is that to procure for a small number or even for a single individual the instantaneous view of a great multitude, uh, that's the goal of a panopticon, of course. Then, uh, skipping over another page or so, we get back to Bentham, the guy who invented the panopticon, and I said, uh, let's just read this. Uh, Julius, I don't know who that is. Julius saw as a fulfilled historical process that which Bentham had described as a technical program. Our society is not one is one not of spectacle but of surveillance. Under the surface of images, one invests bodies in depth. Behind the great abstraction of exchange, there continues the meticulous, concrete training of useful forces. The circuits of communication are the supports of an accumulation and a centralization of knowledge. The play of signs defines the anchorages of power. 
It is not the beautiful totality of the individual is amputated, repressed, altered by our social order. It is rather that the individual is carefully fabricated in it, according to a whole technique of forces and bodies. We are much less Greeks than we believe. We are neither in the amphitheater nor on the stage, but in a panoptic machine, invested by its effects of power, which we bring to ourselves since we are part of its mechanism. The importance in historical mythology of the Napoleonic character probably derives from the fact that it is, it is at a point of junction of the monarchical ritual exercise of sovereignty and the hierarchical permanent exercise of indefinite discipline. Didn't mark anything. There's just pages, empty pages here. Let's see. Lastly, the disciplines have to bring into play the power relations, not above, but inside the very texture of multiplicity, as discreetly as possible, as well as articulated on the other functions of these multiplicities, and also in the least expensive way possible. To this correspond anonymous instruments of power, coextensive with the multiplicity that they regiment, such as hierarchical surveillance, continued registration, perpetual assessment, and classification. In short, to substitute for a power that is manifested through the brilliance of those who exercise it, a power that, is insidiously, that insidiously objectifies those whom it is applied. To form a body of knowledge about these individuals, rather than to deploy the ostentatious signs of sovereignty. In a word, the disciplines are the ensemble of miniature technical inventions that made it possible to increase the useful size of multiplicities by decreasing the inconveniences of the power which, in order to make them useful, must control them. Obviously, reduce the reduce the power to increase the useful size of multiplicities by decreasing inconveniences to them. If the economic takeoff of the West began with the techniques that made the, po the accumulation that made possible the accumulation of capital, it might perhaps be said that the methods for administering the accumulation of men made possible a political takeoff in relation to the traditional, ritual, costly, violent forms of power which soon fell into disuse and were superseded by a subtle, calculated technology of subjection. In fact, the two processes, the accumulation of men and the accumulation of capital, cannot be separated. It would not have been possible to solve the problem of the accumulation of men without the growth of an apparatus of production capable of both sustaining them and using them. Conversely, the techniques that made the accumulated multiplicity of men useful accelerated, accelerated the accumulation of capital. At a less general level, the technological mutations of the apparatus of production, the division of labor, and the elaboration of the disciplinary techniques sustained by an ensemble of very close relations, C.F. Marx, Capital, Volume 1, Chapter 13, and a very interesting analysis of Guerrian de Lule, each makes the possible and necessary, I'm just going to skip ahead here, the panoptic modality of power at the elementary, technical, merely physical level is just situated, is not under the immediate dependence extension of the uh, of the great juridicio political structure political structure of society is nonetheless not absolute and in, absolutely independent historically the processes by which the bourgeois become in the course of the 18th century the political the dominant class was masked by the establishment of an explicit coded and formally egalitarian judicial framework juridicial framework which made possible by the or organization of a parliamentary representative regime. Now, I didn't mark anything for like a page, two pages here. There's just nothing. Apparently, then this chapter sucks. Yeah, I seriously had nothing to say about it after that point. But, um, Panopticism, chapter three. Michel Foucault, Discipline and Punish, the good book. It's worth a read. You should maybe check it out. It'll make a little more sense maybe if you read it than if you just hear me talking about it. But, um, what it all comes down to is that at this point in our society, we've sort of internalized the sense of discipline, right? Like, we just started to learn that there's a chance that anybody could be watching anybody and everybody is expected to report on everyone else. So the idea is that, like, the more that you're convinced that somebody's watching, the more you're convinced that you need to be the best person you can be or you need to be, you know, under the strictest regulations possible so that if somebody is watching, you can't possibly be held accountable for the bad things that you've done. And if nobody's watching, you'll never know. So we're sort of trapped in this, uh, this disciplinary society. So thanks to Michelle Foucault for pointing that out. Thanks to everybody else for coming to watch this, uh, this video. I really appreciate you sticking with me. I um, hope you all learned something. I hope I learned something. If you have any questions, feel free to text me. I gave you guys my number. I'll give it to you one more time. 512. 
And um, yeah, message me on Facebook, facebook.com slash sam.goldstein90. Hit me up on my email. It's sgolds2 at scic.edu. Answer some questions. Um, I'm just I'm just here to just you know have a good time. All right, bye guys.